Okay, I do anticipate we'll have a few more joining us yet, but I'm going to go ahead and get started with the score intro because I want to make sure we have enough time to get to everyone's questions that they may have um, in today's webinar. Uh, it is an important webinar, so legal issues facing business owners, and we have our own um, David Berman from Score Boston uh, to give the presentation, and uh, he's about to share with you um, a ton of information that you're going to find useful for your uh, business, for sure. Uh, just to get to talk about SCORE initially, uh, SCORE does training with the webinars. We have uh, a, lot of, a lot of subjects we cover each season. Um, we have uh, sessions going up to through the first week of December, and then we'll restart in January. But if you haven't looked through the whole list of, of offerings, um, please take a look and I'll, I'll post those websites on the um, chat here uh, in, a, in a moment. Uh, the most important thing that SCORE does is mentoring. Our mentoring is free and confidential. Our mentors are volunteers that have knowledge to share. They have experiences and expertise in different business subjects that they can um, give you uh, information and guidance to assist you. Uh, we work with folks that are thinking about starting a business in the process of starting that business or already in business. They're looking to grow or they're having certain issues with um, different business issues. We work with the whole, the whole gamut. Uh, you do not you do not have to have a business plan already. You do not have to have a business registered already to meet with a mentor. You only need to have that idea and that desire to be in business. Uh, our sessions, I'm often asking, asked what they're like. Um, they usually run in the 30 minute to 45 to 60 minute range, depending on where the client is at. Uh, that first session is about um, you sharing where you are in the process and talking about your goals, your challenges, what you want to achieve. And um, that mentor will help you come up with a, a, a plan of attack to, to, to reaching those goals. Uh, oftentimes, they'll bring in other mentors as your needs change to help fill in any gaps that uh, might need to be taken care of. How do you get a mentor? You can put a note in chat and just say, hey, I want a mentor and I'll make sure that the right chapter reaches out to you. You can also go to the websites listed here. And this is where I was talking about, uh, you can also find the information for the different webinars. You can also find different tools and templates, all kinds of information on these websites. There, there's just tons of things to, to look up and find on there, information that we have to share. So I will put those in the, um, in the chat um, shortly here so that you can access that information. Uh, we are using Q&A. Uh, it allows me to make sure we don't lose any uh, questions. We will answer questions at the end of each slide. So please put those questions in there and I will ask them of our presenter. Um, if you don't want to type in the question, uh, we can also use the hand raise um, icon as well. And you'll find it under reactions on your, on your toolbar. Just raise your hand and I will unmute you so that you can ask your question out loud if you prefer that. Uh, we're happy to do it either way. Uh, you can use chat for everything else. And um, we'll, but that's what we're going to, that's the plan. So at the end of each slide, we'll, we'll, we'll answer any questions you have. Uh, and you can use hand rate, the hand raise icon or put that question into Q&A. Okay, I'm going to bring this down and I'm going to turn it over to David. It's all yours. Thank you. Thanks very much. I'm just going to uh, share a screen here and we can get going. Um, by way of background, I've been with SCORE for, for, I just know when I started, it was the pandemic was just declared. And so it would have been March in uh, 2020, I guess. 2019, I can't remember, but in any event, I've been with SCORE for, for that time. I practiced law uh, for 40 odd years uh, before I retired, uh, focused on uh, advising businesses, all aspects, whether it be uh, financing, whether it be uh, partnership agreements, uh, real estate leases, real estate acquisitions, uh, buying and selling businesses, and unfortunately, even some bankruptcies. So um, I, I do have a general business background. 
And, uh, you know, this presentation will be, uh, you know, a broad brush of things to think about. Um, if you have specific questions, we can ask on this uh, seminar or we can uh, set up an appointment with a mentor and we can get into it more deeply. One thing you should be aware of is that under the SCORE uh, ethics rules, we are not permitted to represent you, whether it be in legal matters or another counselor in terms of uh, doing your accounting and your bookkeeping. We, we're advisors. Um, we give you the best advice we, you, we can, but uh, if you need uh, somebody to draft documents for you or do your books, for example, you, you really need to contact a professional. And, and we have a, a list of professionals that uh, uh, our clients have uh, used successfully that we can refer you if you don't know anybody uh, uh, on your own. That being said, let's jump into the, the substance. Um, all right. The, if you're thinking about going into business, one of the things you need to consider is, do I need a license from a, from a regulatory authority? For example, if you're a doctor, you're going to need a, a state license. Um, if you're a real estate broker, you're going to need a state license. Uh, if you're selling alcohol, you're going to need an alcohol uh, or beer and wine license in order to sell. Um, if you're developing real estate, uh, you will have to comply with the local zoning ordinances and may need to go before the local zoning board in order to obtain a, uh, a permit or a, or a variance for what you're trying to do. Um, similarly, there are conservation commissions that would deal with wetlands uh, that you uh, need to consider. And of course, if you're, you're building, you're going to need a building permit and you may need contractors licenses and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, if you're selling wholesaler, you want to get a, um, a resale license so that you don't have to collect sales tax from the person you're selling to, uh, that you're not, you're selling to somebody who's going to resell it as opposed to you use it. So depending upon the nature of your business and uh, uh, you know, what you're doing, you may need to get a license and um, there is a, uh, um, there is a uh, provision in the state, if you go to Secretary of State, there's licensing, Massachusetts licensing, it will tell you who needs a license. You know, I should add other than doctors, massage therapists, and electricians, and so on and so forth. So there are many, many businesses for which you'll need a license in order to, uh, to practice that business. So once you uh, have decided that you have all of the legal qualifications you need, uh, and you have your business plan, uh, the question is, where are you going to conduct the business? And, uh, you know, a lot of people are not going to physical locations, rather they're operating out of their home or uh, you know, phone or whatever, but there are a lot of businesses that still need physical locations. Uh, you know, if you're uh, manufacturing goods, you'll need a physical location. While there's a lot of retail online, a lot of retail, as we all know, are uh, uh, physical locations. Um, you know, if you're a, uh, a massage therapist, the most or many massage therapists rent space and perform their services in those space. So when you're thinking of, of renting space and you're talking to a landlord, what things should you consider? And the first one is, something all real estate agents will tell you, location, location, location. You know, if you're a, a selling retail goods, you wanna be on a place that's visible, that has parking, uh, and that will attract traffic, um, is accessible, and potentially gives you room for expansion. Uh, you, know, you wouldn't wanna be in the place where even on, uh, Google Maps, they couldn't find you because, uh, because you're off the beaten path, as it were. Um, you know, if you're going into a medical practice, you know, having accessible parking and uh, building the accessible to your clients is, is important. So location is important. And this 
takes some research. Uh, it's not just saying, oh, it's Main Street, but if you're running a restaurant, you don't want to be renting space next to four other restaurants on Main Street. You may want to find a different location if you're uh, if you're selling uh, um, gift cards, uh, gift uh, not cards, but uh, greeting cards. And you know you don't want to necessarily be next to a Hallmark store. You may want to be at a different location. So location is important not only in terms of accessibility, but in terms of assessing the needs of the area and the and the competition. Um, so then you start talking with the landlord about the terms of the lease. So is the building complete? Are you taking it in its then condition, walking in, or do some modifications have to be made to the building to make it uh, good for your use? For example, I had one client who was doing a daycare center and she had to build in bathrooms and uh, make the building accessible. Uh, and so there was a lot of work to be done. It was a good location, a good, a good size, but there was work to be done. So you need to price this out and you need to also determine how much of it you will do and how much the landlord will do or will the landlord pay for part of it, give you an allowance to, to, uh, uh, to do some of the work. Uh, is the landlord going to pay for it all? Or are you going to pay for it all? And uh, so that's the first thing, fitting the space out. Who's going to do the work? What's the cost and the, and the time frame? Um, you know, my client with the daycare centers started in April, so she could open in September. And uh, between the work that had to get done and the licensing from the state and so on and so forth, uh, she should make September. She started in October. Uh, so you have to build these things into when you're starting your, uh, uh, your business and your lease. Similarly, um, you know, when you're talking to the landlord and construction is to be done, when are you going to have to start paying rent? Is it when the landlord's completed his work? Is it when you've completed your work? Uh, or do you pay rent from day one and you do the work and you're paying rent for the building while you're uh, in construction and um, yet you're not in, uh, incurring any revenue because you're still not open for business. Um, so you could talk to landlords about having a, a fit up period where you don't have to pay rent. It's, it's yours, but you don't have to pay rent for three months, six months, uh, you know, whatever you can negotiate to give you time to complete the work and open up for business and start incurring and receiving revenues before you start paying the rent. Um, then in terms of what you'll pay for rent, most landlords will have you pay a base rent, which is your monthly rent of X dollars a month. Um, landlords usually will also ask you for a security deposit, whether it be uh, last month's rent plus uh, an additional amount to cover any damage to the premises when you move out, or whether it's first and last month's rent. But as you're trying to uh, think about what are your expenses going to be to open this business, you know, what the landlord is going to require as a, I'll call it a down payment, uh, needs to be taken into account. Then, in addition to your base rent, Many landlords will have you uh, pay uh, rent based upon the real estate taxes, the insurance charges, the common area maintenance charges, and the like. So if you're in the, uh, let's call it the Burlington Mall, the landlord maintains the mall, uh, you're going to pay for his maintenance of the mall. The landlord pays taxes in the mall and insures the mall. And the way that usually works is that you pay a percentage of those costs based upon the ratio of the amount of space you're leasing to the total space in the, in the uh, premises. So if you have a, uh, a thousand feet of space in a hundred thousand uh, foot prem premises or mall, uh, you'll probably pay, uh, you know, 1% of the costs for uh, 
uh, the real estate taxes, the insurance, and the maintenance charges. You should definitely, before signing the lease, have the landlord give you uh, some evidence of what those additional charges are, at least for the past year, knowing that they will go up during the term of your lease and uh, you know your share will, will increase. Um, so depending upon where you go, some landlords will just want the base rent and they'll pay for everything else. Other landlords will uh, require that the base rent be net to them, meaning without deduction for taxes, uh, insurance, common area charges, and the like. Um, in addition, uh, leases may provide that the landlord provides you with water uh, and utilities, or you may pay your own water and utilities. And if that is the case, you don't want to pay a percentage of the total bill, make sure that the landlord has them separately metered so that you can just look at your meter to see what your electrical and your water use uh, is. So these are all things to think about in terms of getting into the lease, completing the premises, what is it gonna cost me? Then um, you see the bullet point, tenancy at will versus term. In tenancy at will, you have no long-term obligation. You can terminate the lease on 30 days notice to the landlord and the landlord can terminate your tenancy on 30 day notice. Um, the benefit of that is you're not locked in long term. On the other hand, most people starting a business want some certainty that they're going to be able to use their premises for a period of time. So you would want to uh, have a term, you know, that may go one, two, three, four, five years. Uh, so you know you as long as you comply with the lease that you're there, rather than being subject to the landlords telling you. Uh, you have to leave the premises in, uh, in 30 days. That would be very disruptive for the business. Um, now, with that, you, know, you may want to say, I'm not sure whether this business is gonna make it or not. I don't wanna have a long-term lease that I'm gonna be obligated on uh, whether or not the business makes it. Most landlords in new startup small businesses will require the owner to sign a personal guarantee. So even if you form a limited liability company or corporation or some other entity, uh, while the entity is on the hook for the full lease, you also personally will be. So therefore, you're putting your personal assets, your house, your car, your, your boat, your vacation house, your bank accounts, all at risk if you sign the guarantee. So you may say, you know, I'm willing to take a little bit of risk to get into the business, but I'm not certain that I want to, uh, um, you know, be on the hook for a long time. So you could negotiate with the landlord that you're going to have a term of X years, say, let's just say three years, and that you have the right to extend the lease before the end of the three years. So for example, you could say, I want a three year lease. And I want the right within six months of the end of the third year to tell you I'm going to stay for another three years or another five years, whatever the ex option to extend would be. And um, so that you give a decision point every three or five years, and I'm just using three or five as examples, as to whether you want to extend the lease and continue to, to be at that location or close up the business with no further uh, lease obligation or move to some other location if this location isn't right for you. Um, so landlords will uh, frequently be willing to give you an option to extend as long as you give them enough notice before the end of your lease term so that if you say I'm not extending, the landlord can go out and try to market it to find another tenant. Um, the rent during the extension period will generally increase. Uh, the, the base rent, obviously the additional rent items we talked about are variable based upon what the charges are being made to the landlord by the insurance company and the taxing authorities and the like. Uh, but they'll usually increase your rent. It may be an agreed amount that you increase like $1,000 a year, or it may be a consumer price index that he'll, he'll increase it so that the rent equals any increase in the consumer price index since the time you first entered into the lease. Um, uh, 
But that is a way to deal with uh, the uncertainty of having this obligation over your head. You wouldn't want to enter into a 10 year lease with a business you're not sure is going to be, be successful. You'd want to have a shorter term to assess it. Um, you'll also want the lease to have use limitations. If you're in a strip mall or an indoor mall um, and you're uh, Selling greeting cards, you may want the to landlord to agree that he's not going to lease in this mall uh, to any other business that's going to sell greeting cards because that's going to impact your revenues. Um, you know, you as a small business person, you may or may not have the ability to do that, but you know, I, I would guarantee you that if uh, uh, if Shaw's went into a mall they would get an agreement with the landlord that the landlord won't have any other grocery stores in that mall. Um, but this is something that uh, you need to think about because to the extent there's competition in a mall um, or in a location, that's gonna impact your revenues. Now, you know, we all know you're not always gonna get that. You go into a mall, how many different clothing stores are there? Uh, uh, there, there's not going to be a, a restriction on clothing, um, but perhaps you could get a restriction that says uh, no one else can sell Canadian goose winter coats. And uh, uh, so it's not a restriction on clothing, it's a narrower restriction that you can try to obtain. Um, now, um, another thing that you should think about and landlords always think about is if for some reason your business doesn't make a go of it, or if you decide to sell the business, whoever's buying the business um, or whoever you may find to take your space want, may want to step into that lease and use that premises for himself. The leases generally uh, provide that you cannot transfer the lease to somebody without the landlord's consent. And that is an enforceable provision. Uh, the landlord should not unreasonably withhold his consent, but the landlord sh uh, should have the right to uh, uh, look at who you're assigning it to. For example, if you were to assign it to uh, uh, a cannabis shop, maybe the landlord doesn't want cannabis uh, in his mall. If you're going to assign it to somebody that's been through bankruptcy three times, maybe the landlord doesn't want to take that financial risk. But you, you should focus on the assignment provisions because one way to get out of a lease is to find somebody else to take it over. And you wanna have the flexibility to do that. And uh, if the landlord insists on, uh, uh, on assignment approval, then you, know, you can either negotiate not to be unreasonably withheld, which will be a factual determinant at the time, or you know, in some larger situations, the landlord agrees on what is uh, a reasonable financial condition of the assignee. In other words, the assignee gives financial statements and uh, can demonstrate its ability to pay going forward and that there shouldn't be a default. Um, options to purchase and right of first refusal. I, have, I throw this in because I have one client who uh, has a lease and they found uh, that the rent that they're paying would exceed what they would pay to a bank for a mortgage. And they could significantly cut their expenses if they could buy the, uh, this was a condominium unit, commercial condominium unit that they were operating from. Their lease did give them the right to purchase the building at a stated price at the end of the term. Um, so if this is something that uh, you think you may want to have, it doesn't obligate you to buy the building. It doesn't obligate you to do anything. It just means that at a certain point in time for a certain price, the landlord will sell you the premises. Uh, the right of first refusal would be if the landlord decides to sell, that the landlord has to come to you and say, I want to sell the building for $100, uh, yeah, I don't know any building that I wouldn't pay $100 for, but hey, I want to sell the building for $100. And before I do, uh, under the lease, I have to ask you if you want to buy it for the $100. And, um, you know, so therefore, on the one option, it's 
if you want to buy it, on the other option, if the landlord wants to sell and you want to uh, protect yourself from a, a new uh, uh, landlord coming in. Um, another thing we talked about a lot in COVID was force majeure. I'm sure you've all read or maybe even experienced the fact that people wanted their landlords to give them concessions to uh, not pay their rent or to reduce their rent because of the impacts of, of COVID. Uh, most leases will have a force majeure clause, which provides that if any act of God or any other event like uh, tornado, hurricane, war, prevents either party from fulfilling its obligations, uh, the party is excused from fulfilling those obligations uh, while that event continues. Now, in 99 percent of the cases, there is a proviso to that that would say that this doesn't apply to your obligations to pay rent. So while many leases during COVID had this force majeure clause, they most of them said, but you still have to pay rent. Now, since force majeure, uh, I know many people have been trying to uh, since COVID, I should say, many people have been trying to negotiate in provisions that if there's a pandemic, uh, that the rent will get abated. Landlords aren't wildly receptive about this, but it's something to think about because we've had recent experience where a lot of businesses uh, were uh, shut down uh, and or failed because they couldn't meet their rent obligations during the pandemic. Um, the question I often get is landlords often require subordination or non-disturbance agreements. What th this means, is it's really a legal concept that doesn't hurt you. Uh, what it means is that you would subordinate your lease to the mortgage of the landlord on the premises so that the, the, the mortgage has priority over your lease. Uh, and the reason for that is if the mortgage didn't have you subordinate and your lease predated the mortgage in time, then the bank, when it foreclosed, could not evict you um, or terminate the lease. What the subordination does is it says, all right, bank, you're in priority to me, but it also includes a non-disturbance agreement in which the bank agrees that as long as you're in compliance with the lease, and pay the amounts due under the lease, that it will allow you to continue to occupy the premises under the lease. So it really uh, drafted properly, avoids your having to worry about the landlord not paying his bank and his bank foreclosing uh, because the bank is agreeing that it or somebody that buys at the foreclosure will recognize your lease as long as you're, you're not in default. Um, you know, in default and remedies, uh, you know, this is probably something that doesn't get looked at enough except by attorneys. Uh, you don't want to be in a position where you don't pay rent on January 1st when it's due and on January 2nd, the landlord evicts you because you, you breached the lease. Uh, you don't want to be in a position where um, you've agreed to uh, uh, sweep the premises uh, in front of the building uh, on a daily basis to keep it clean where you were sick one day and couldn't do it and the landlord says you're out. So we like to build in um, grace periods in the defaults for the tenants to say it's not that if you don't pay rent when it's due but it's not if, if you don't pay rent within x number of days after the due date which gives you some period to to have grace and uh, for non-payment defaults, it would be if you don't perform your obligation within X number of days after you receive a notice from the landlord that you haven't performed, because you may not even be aware of some of these things, because most people take the leases and put them in the bottom draw, <coughs> excuse me, and don't, uh, don't necessarily look at them. So, um, you know, for... Uh, for payment defaults, sometimes you get five, seven days. For, for uh, non-payments, you can get 15 or 30 days after notice. But you would want to receive that kind of notice in order to uh, protect yourself from being inadvertently defaulted. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, in terms of remedies, 
you would also want the landlord to agree in the lease that he will go out and try to relet the premises after he's thrown you out and that the rent is not accelerated. So let's take an example, you have a five-year lease and after the second year, you haven't been able to pay the landlord evicts you. You don't wanna be in a position where the landlord says, you now have to write me a check for the next three years. You don't wanna be in a position where the landlord says, eh, you know, I'm just gonna sit back and, and try to collect from you every month as the rent comes due. You want the landlord to go out and actively market the property so that if he was charging you $10 a foot and he could relet it for $8 a foot, you'd only be on the hook for $2 a foot. Or in these times, if you were uh, renting it for $10 a foot and the market was $15 a foot, he'd have no damages because he's doing better than he would have done on, with you. So you want to definitely have something that the landlord will mitigate his damages to the best of his ability. And you also want to say that, you know, the, they can't come to you and ask you for the full three years that they can ask you every month for the rent, but they can't accelerate it. So that if for some reason you go out of business and you're on the hook on the personal guarantee, you only have to find uh, a way to pay this month by month until the landlord gets a new tenant rather than the landlord suing you immediately for three years rent. Now landlords may re, re, uh, reject that last request, but it's worth taking, but the important thing is the landlord has to go out and mitigate his loss, try to find a new tenant and reduce the amount that you owe him. Uh, we have any questions at this point? Uh, I do not have any posted, but I would encourage anyone that has questions about this slide specifically, um, please go ahead and use that raise hand icon under reactions on the toolbar or to or type that question into the Q&A and we'll get that answered. Um, if you have anything on leases or licenses to conduct business. Okay, let me, uh, we have a question. I'm gonna go ahead and you can go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Thank you. Hi, um, David, I have a question about um, when you were referring to um, making, I'm sorry, I wrote it down. Um, when you work with like the mortgage company to make sure that if the landlord doesn't fulfill their financial obligations that you are protected, how mm -hmm. would you go about doing that? Like, how, is that something that's in your leasing contract? Can you just repeat that part again? Yeah, that, that would be, first of all, that's something that the landlord probably will be required to get from, by his bank. Okay. So it would be in the leasing contract and the way it usually is at the landlord's request, you will sign this agreement as long as you, as long as the bank agrees that it will allow you to continue to operate. But you as the tenant can um, ask the landlord to get an agreement from his bank. Um, you know, so you, you can put it, it would be in your lease that the agreement won't be in the lease, but the obligation of the landlord to get it or for you to provide it to the landlord would be in the lease. Great, thank you. Okay, um, what is the Secretary of State site where you can look up leases that are needed? Or right. look at licenses, sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, I don't have it off the top of my head, but I can uh, send it to you after the call and uh, then you can post it for everybody. How's that? All right, sounds good. Okay, that's all the questions we have right now. Okay, good. Should have brought water in as well. Should have done, but okay. So a lease is one type of contract. There are other contracts that you'll enter into uh, in connection with your business, and the first one uh, is employment. Are you going to hire people? Uh, what are the terms of hire? And what are your obligations? Um, Let's talk about the difference between an employee and an independent contractor. Think of an independent contractor as your toilet is clogged and you can't fix it, so you call a plumber. And the plumber comes and does the job and you pay him a fee. And that's the end of your relationship with your plumber until you need more plumbing work at a later date. 
you know, he's not expected to be on call 24 seven for you. He's, he has other clients that he's servicing and, um, uh, you know, he's just doing a job for you. Um, as opposed to an employee who you're going to expect to work certain hours, be subject to your control and direction uh, and be paid a salary by you uh, as opposed to the contractor who's just going to say my fee for this is $50 and you pay him $50. Uh, the importance of this distinction is for uh, a new business uh, and, and you know other existing businesses. Uh, independent contractors, you really don't have control over uh, when they do it or how they do the job. You know, think of the plumber example. You know, you're going to say, I have a toilet clogged. He'll say, I'll be there tomorrow. I mean, you, you can't say to him, drop everything and come here today. Uh, you can't tell him, uh, I want you to use this wrench rather than that wrench. Uh, he's in charge of his business and you have less control of him. You've hired him to do a specific job. Similarly, when you pay him, you pay him his fee. You don't have to withhold taxes from him. You don't have to uh, contribute to social security for him. Uh, you don't need to um, otherwise promise him future work. Um, and, you know, it's just a one lump sum. You pay him, he takes care of his own taxes. He pays his own employees from what you pay him. You don't pay his employees. Um, and, and it's done. As an employee, though, you would pay somebody the gross salary. I mean, we probably all know this. Then they, they deduct your share, the employee's share of withholding taxes and Social Security and and other uh, deductions, and the, and the business owner also has to pay in to the government additional amounts of money on behalf of that employee. So it is a little more costly for someone to have uh, an employee than to have an independent contractor. A lot of businesses try to make people independent contractors and the state or the IRS will come in and say, no, they're really employees and you have to have paid them a minimum wage and you have to have withheld these amounts. And there can be some severe penalties and, and even criminal penalties uh, if you uh, fail to, uh, to have done these things, you know? And, um, you know, so it's important that you characterize these people properly, uh, but a lot of businesses starting up will want to try to get people to be independent contractors rather than employees. For example, you want to do a website. You, know, you could have an employee who's in charge of your intellectual property and doing the website and you pay him weekly, uh, regardless of what he or she did that week. And you'd be able to tell him, I want to change the website. I want to do this or that. Or you could hire another company to do your website you pay them a fee and they do the website and you pay them another fee, they maintain it, but they're not under your, your control. So it's usually, uh, I don't wanna say less expensive because independent contractors know how to charge, but it's usually less of a burden on, the, uh, on a startup business to have independent contractors rather than employees. On the other hand, if you have a, uh, a retail store and you need service clerks, those are going to be employees uh, um, that are going to come in and they'll be there at your direction at the times that you tell them, and they'll be paid a salary, an hourly salary, which of course we all know is a minimum wage that so you, you need to pay for an employee, whether it's with an independent contractor, you, uh, um, you know, pay, the, pay the fee and there's no uh, minimum that you have to pay. If you can get somebody to repair your toilet for $50, you pay him $50, you don't have to pay him $100 that the other guy would charge. Um, furthermore, an independent contractor is not entitled to benefits. So if you have a company and you have a policy of providing health insurance or vacation pay or personal family time or something like that, you don't have to give any of that to the independent contractor. But you know, depending upon you know, how it's structured, your employees may be entitled to those benefits that you provide for other employees. 
You know, if you have a, uh, a profit sharing plan, the independent contractor doesn't come into that. The, uh, will, the employee would, you know, 401k plans and so on and so forth. Uh, so there is a difference between someone being an independent contractor and employee. Now, let's assume you hire an employee. Most people will hire employees as at-will employees, which means you can hire them and fire them at any time with or without cause, and they can leave your employee whenever they want with or without a reason. Um, you know, there's less certainty in this which is why you'll find um, you know, larger companies sign their employees to a contract for a term which obligates the employees to work for that employer solely, unless there's something else in the contract that allows them to do something for the term of the contract. And the, uh, you know, an example I would give is if anybody's familiar with sports contracts, you know that uh, those of us who believe in earn your performance think there should only be one year contracts. And if you don't perform in that one year period, you're gone. I can terminate you. But all the players like to get a contract for you know, a seven year, five year, 10 year term because they know that they'll earn that money over five or 10 years, regardless of their performance. Um, you know, if you're hiring uh, someone to be the uh, Chief Executive Officer of General Motors, you're going to want to have a contract that obligates that person to be there for a specific term. You're not going to want that person to be there uh, at will that he can walk out after a week and say, I'm done. Um, and so you have to think about the nature of your business. I would say that most of your employees will be at will employees, except for your key employees, who you may want to tie up for a term. Um, then uh, another thing that we often tell clients to do is to have an employee handbook. And, and um, because you're not going to have a written contract with all of your employees, most likely. Your key employees you'll have a written contract with. But if you hire uh, someone to answer the phones or uh, someone to uh, in the copy center to make copies and and make deliveries for you, you're probably not gonna have an employment contract with them, but there are still certain key policies that you're going to want them to follow. So you want policies on you know, dress code, uh, vacation scheduling, um, sexual harassment or any other kind of harassment, um, you know, the procedures to be followed uh, in, in connection with all of these policies. So it is, you know, I call it an employee handbook, depending on the size of your business. Um, you know, it may not become a quote handbook, but you should have uh, expectations or policies written down that you can give the employee so that if they come to work uh, dressed in jeans and you wanted them to be in business attire, you can say, listen, didn't you read the company policy on this and, and ask them to, to comply with this. Um, so. Even without a contract, you should have, I'll call them rules for the employees uh, that you can give them and deliver to them. And you can update those rules and change those rules uh, and uh, uh, you know, whatever it may be. You know, we talked about certain rules. Maybe you want to have something in there about entitlement to benefits. So you have to be there for four years before you get your fully paid health insurance. And, in year one and two, we'll pay 10%. Whatever the rules are, you should have those written out for your protection and uh, uh, to assist you in dealing with the employees. Um, the, uh, another thing that you may want employees to sign and is uh, a non-disclosure agreement, depending upon the information that is going to come across, you don't want the employee to go home at the dinner table and tell all your business secrets to, uh, to his family, or nor do you want him to tell them to his friends who may be in competition with you or whatever. So you would want the employee to sign something saying that they'll keep your business's confidential information confidential and won't disclose it to anybody. Um, now, there are exceptions for that. Obviously, if a court orders him to disclose it, 
then uh, he or she will be obligated to disclose it. But in that case, you would want him to come to you and say, the court's ordering me to do this. And uh, you can then take action to limit what, what gets disclosed by taking action in the court. Um, if it's something that's already in the public uh, domain, you know, there's not gonna be a limitation on disclosing it. For instance, if, if we know that there's a full moon every 30 days, that's not your secret. That's, everybody knows that. And if somebody asks him, how often do we get a full moon? He, should, he can tell that because, uh, because that is generally in the public domain. Um, and so there, this really comes more into play, I would say in tech companies, where you have people working on programming and, and uh, uh, developing apps and so on and so forth. Um, you know, it, that's not to say it doesn't come into play in other businesses, but we see this a lot of times in, uh, in the tech world, uh, you know, or if, you know, for example, back to your independent contractor, if you hire somebody to do your website and you have to give the independent contractor uh, information about your business uh, that you're not putting on the website that you want you want the web developer not to disclose your business information uh, or if you have somebody working on a program for you a uh, computer program you don't want them to disclose your confidential information so this is always something to think about which is who is this employee what's it doing what information is it going to be getting and do i want him or her to sign a confidentiality agreement uh, to prevent him from disclosing it. Some companies just have all employees the day they're hired signing on a confidentiality agreement. I'm not sure whether that's really necessary, but you should think about that with your business. Similarly, in non-solicitation, um, let's assume I'm working for your company and I say, I can do this. And I, uh, I quit the job and I say, I'm opening my own shop in competition with you. Well, do you want them to solicit other employees of your business to come work with them and leave you. you know, let's, do you want them to be able to call your clients and say, I've started my own business? Um, you know, there, there'll be a re, unlikely that this will be a forever restriction, but you may want to say for six months after you leave me, you're not going to come and ask Tom to come work with you and you're not going to call XYZ company and ask them to leave me and come to you. Um, so, a non-solicitation provision is something, depending upon the nature of your business and your clientele and your workforce, you may want to have an employee sign as well. Um, finally, a non-compete agreement. There's a lot of discussion across the country about are these enforceable or not, because they should uh, not prevent someone from earning a living. Each state is different. Massachusetts has, uh, has its own laws regarding non-compete. Um, which are pretty detailed. And, and if you're doing non-compete, I would recommend that you consult an attorney to make sure it's drafted right. And you give all the proper disclosures to the, uh, to the employee, which are required under the law. But in general, you should be able to enforce non-compete as long as you limit the geographical area and the time frame. So if you, um, tell somebody that they can't compete with you for a year, that may be okay. If you tell them they can't compete with you for 15 years, that probably isn't gonna be okay. <coughs> Similarly, if you, uh, if you uh, do business in Massachusetts and you say you don't want him to compete with you in New England, that may be okay. If you tell them that you don't want them to compete with you in Iowa, probably not. And in small businesses, it's sometimes not states, it's a geographical limitation. You say like, let's assume you have a, um, a hardware store. You'll say you don't want them to compete within 30 miles of your store, 50 miles of your store. Something like that is more likely to be enforceable than if you say they can't compete in the whole state when you're, you know, you're located in Chelsea and they're trying to open a place in Springfield. Um, <laughs> now, the non-competes also are more enforceable against certain types of employees. For instance, if it's an executive officer, your CFO, you know, you may get have a better chance of enforcing that than you would against your receptionist. 
Matter of fact, you definitely would have a better chance. And so the, the uh, executive offices and, uh, are going to be um, more likely to be bound by this than not. Similarly, if you sell your business, you know, let's take that hardware store in Chelsea. You want to get out of the business and you sell it to me. I may well have a non-compete because you've built up a lot of goodwill and, uh, and contacts in Chelsea over the years you've owned the business. And I don't want you opening another hardware store down the street and taking your clients with you. Um, I have one recent case where a client, a score client, bought a, uh, an acupuncture business from somebody. And um, the somebody opened up, you know, next town and basically took all the clients with her. Not good. Um, so if you're selling a business, you should definitely think about getting a non-compete uh, from, <clears throat> from, um, from the seller so that the seller doesn't go back into business uh, against you. Um, and, and take business away. But the key thing is to remember how long and what geography, because uh, you know, as I said, go to Springfield from Chelsea, probably not a problem. You know, go to uh, uh, whatever's that, revered from Chelsea, you know, maybe there's an issue there. Um, another thing to remember as to the public, and this is the vicarious liability and agency issue. Somebody is working for you and they act within the scope of their duties, you or your company, if you have a company, is going to be bound by their actions. So that if you know your salesman goes out and says, I'm going to sell you uh, 12 pounds of rubber for a dollar a pound, and you and you said you couldn't do that your company's probably going to be bound by his agreement unless he says something like subject to start checking with the home office or I'll talk to the home office about whether I can get it for a dollar a pound. But if he goes out and does a purchase order and says a dollar a pound and he's working for you and he's your salesman, you're going to be bound by that. Now, you may, you know, take steps to uh, limit his authority or terminate him, but you'll be bound by that. It's just if somebody's driving your company car and they get into an accident, your company, just as well as the driver, is going to be responsible. So as between uh, you, know, you and the employee, you may have some defenses saying, you know, you acted beyond the scope of your authority, or, the, uh, you know, and you may have some defenses against the third party. For example, um, let's assume that, uh, you know, your uh, receptionist signs a contract uh, for you to, uh, uh, you know, have somebody provide you with web services. Well, the guy providing the web services probably knows that the receptionist doesn't have that kind of authority. And so it would be unreasonable for him or her to rely upon the receptionist's signature. So that could be a defense too. But, you know, on the salesman example, you know, a salesman walks into my place and says, I'll sell you this for a dollar. You know, I'm a salesman for so-and-so, produces a card and, and, whatever, you know, I can really see and expect that he's a salesman for your company and that's going to be binding on your company. So, um, you know, if, if people don't um, have job descriptions, you may want to think about giving them job descriptions, saying this is what you're authorized to do, this is what you're not authorized to do, um, you know, and you could do that in a letter in which you're offering them employment. You could just do that as part of their contract if you have a contract, or you could give, you know, have your policy manual saying you will only do what's in your job description and give each person a personal job description um, in terms of what that is so that you know, they'll know and you'll be on a record that they don't have the right to do X, Y, and Z. Um, and, um, you know, it's... Uh, Similar to if you give me the power to sign checks and I write a check to uh, um, uh, the Museum of Fine Arts as a charitable donation, and I had the authority to sign the check, Museum of Fine Arts isn't gonna to have to give that money back. They're gonna keep it and you'll be bound by it because you gave me check signing authority. And as far as they're concerned, 
you know, I was, you know, once again, if I'm the receptionist, it's one thing, but if I'm an officer of the company, it's another. So always uh, be cognizant of the, uh, of the facts that people you hire that are working for you have certain rights and duties. Uh, and, you know, independent contractors, you clearly want to say that they have no ability to enter into contracts for you, no ability to do anything on your behalf other than the contract they've been hired for. So beyond the employment contracts, um, you know, there are other contracts that you may have. You know, let's just take somebody who's going to uh, provide educational consulting. So the first thing in the contract is their services. You want to be specific about what is it you're going to do and who's going to do it. If you're a company and you have six consultants working for you, you may want to say that you know, you're not guaranteeing any specific consultant. Any consultant who works for us could provide the consulting to you. Uh, but you want to be specific what it is. Are you going to consult with them to prepare for the SAT exam? Are you going to consult with them on uh, selecting uh, private high schools, selecting colleges? Uh, are you going to work with them on uh, uh, mathematic problems? What is it you're going to work on? Be very specific. You can always say at the end of it, I'm going to work uh, with this client on his math skills and whatever else that we agree upon in writing so that in the future, if you decide you want to help him with his uh, English writing, you can do that, but you, you just sign something with the person signing the contract that says, you know, in addition, we're going to do this. And there may be different payment, term, payment uh, schedules and fee schedules. You know, maybe for math, you charge $100 an hour because it's more complicated and for writing you charge $75 an hour because whatever reason, to me, they're both equally difficult. But uh, so you be very specific on your services and be very specific uh, unless you wish otherwise in terms of that the company is providing the services, no specific individual at the company. Uh, you know, for instance, if you're doing home health care, and this comes up a lot where I'm, I go and I'm the home health care aide but then I get sick or I leave or you need to assign me to somebody else. You want the ability to take somebody else to go provide that patient with home health care. You don't want them to say, no, it was only David that, that could provide it. So you, you wanna be specific there. Uh, payment terms, you wanna set out, you know, what is the cost? How is it being paid? Are they giving a down payment up front? Uh, are they paying, uh, you know, when you give them an invoice, are they paying on a periodic basis? For example, let's assume you're doing a construction contract. You, you want the, uh, uh, the person to give you a down payment of a large amount, and then you want to get paid, not at the end of the job, you want to get paid uh, uh, every two weeks or every four weeks based upon the work you've done. And, uh, and then at the end of the job, you get paid, paid the rest. Uh, similarly, if you're providing some other types of service, uh, you know, I bring my uh, chair in for a repair, the payment terms, I usually give them a deposit now and I pay the balance when I, when I come in, you know, the pay, sometimes people say, I can't afford to pay you like that. And you'll say, okay, you know, I'll agree that you can pay me, uh, uh, in 12 monthly payments, for instance, your auto insurance, you can either pay it in a lump sum or you can pay it monthly over time. So you have to specify what the payment terms are uh, and when the payment is due. Um, you know, is uh, uh, I go to my dentist and my dentist has a sign up says payment is due, ex is expected the time that the service is rendered, which means I can't leave that office without paying. They're not gonna send me a bill and I'll sit on it for 30 days and pay it. Um, so you have to set forth the payment terms. You should also uh, somewhere include the if they don't pay in terms that you're going to get late charges or interest, and if you have to sue them, that they have to pay for your attorneys and so on and so forth. But set forth the payment terms. Um, some contracts you want exclusivity, uh, and by the way, some contracts and services. When I said say that the company does it, you know, if I'm having an artist paint my children, I want that artist to do it. I don't want anybody else. So that should be specified in the contract that that artist is going to do it. Um, Exclusivity, all right, let's assume that you're uh, providing um, Walmart with, uh, with um, televisions. 
you want to be the sole provider to Walmart? Or do you want them to be able to get some from you and some from RCA and some from Sony and, and so on and so forth? What is your relationship in that case? Are you the exclusive provider or just one of many providers? And you know, if you're an exclusive provider, um, you know, that may affect your, your charges too. If, if I know that I'm going to that you sell 500 TVs a year and you're only going to buy TVs from me, I may give you a different price for 500 TVs than I would knowing that you may call me once a month to get two or three TVs. Uh, so exclusivity, um, you know, if your supply comes up in a lot of supply contracts, which is am I the exclusive supplier or one of many and what does that mean? Um, warranties. Um, what warranties do you give on your work? I mean, there's a general warranty in the Massachusetts law that uh, it'll be of good and merchantable quality and fit for the purpose that it was intended for. But, you know, does that mean when you come and put a new roof on my house, you know, you'll always see there's a express warranty it says, you know, the roof is good for 10 years or whatever the, whatever it is. Or, you know, there'll be, uh, when you take a place under a lease, it will say as is and where is, which means there are no warranties. You're taking it, whatever, whatever you find is what you get. And a lot of sales are as is, where is sales, no warranties. But there's some services and, and, and some sales where you get a warranty. You buy a refrigerator, you're going to get a warranty. Uh, that will come from the manufacturer. Um, and those are express warranties. Implied warranties are the ones I told you about under the law. Uh, but, you know, I would say in a lot of my uh, contracts that I do for the clients of SCORE, we ex expressly exclude warranties that, you know, you buy taking everything as is, where is, there's no warranty. Uh, you know, if you're an educational consultant, back to that one, and I'm consulting with you to help my child get into college, um, you know, you're going to have in your contract is I can't guarantee you that he's going to get into any college or any particular college uh, or any particular program. You know, you're excluding all warranties. You don't want somebody to go back and say, you promised me that. I mean, so you'll specifically say there are no warranties whatsoever. Or if there are warranties, you'll want to limit them in terms of time and, and uh, uh, in scope. For instance, if you have a, buy a, a car part you may get a warranty on the part that the, the part will last for five, three years, but they won't, the warranty will exclude any labor to repair the part. Uh, so you can limit your warranties in terms of we guarantee you the part is good, but you know, if we, if it breaks and we have to fix it, you still have to pay for the labor to do that. Um, indemnification clauses are very common in contracts. Um, indemnification clauses basically say that I will hold the other person harmless from any liabilities that arise from my performance of this contract. So that, for example, in my uh, uh, in my plumber's contract, if I had if I had a contract with a plumber, the plumber would say that I'm going to hold the homeowner harmless from anything, uh, any loss or damage it incurs because of my work. So that if I put in uh, uh, a left-hand elbow when I should have put in a right-hand elbow and the, and the fixture explodes and floods the house, that's on me. Um, you know, usually the, the uh, person for whom the work's being done wants an indemnity from the person performing the work so that regardless of what happens, let's say that uh, this has happened to me before when I had some work done in the house, the, the subcontractor of the contractor didn't get paid by the contractor and he called him on me and I say, listen, it's between you and the contractor and the contractor has agreed to indemnify me from those charges. So if you came after me, subcontractor, I'm going to go after the contractor because, you know, first of all, you have no right against me, but the contractor has indemnified me. The exclusions to indemnity usually are for uh, the person receiving the indemnities, negligence or gross misconduct. Um, so for example, if um, somebody says to you, um, um, take this medication, then me medicine is a bad example, but I'll give it anyhow. <laughs> take this medication, but then 
I don't want you getting out of bed for a week. And you hear the instructions, you get the instructions, you take the medication and say, I'm feeling fine. What's the doctor talking about? And you get out of bed and then you have a problem and the doctor shouldn't be responsible because you were negligent, grossly negligent and acted in violation of his instructions. So, you know, there are, are things like that that can get excluded from indemnities if the basically the homeowner in that case causes his own problem or, or the patient causes his own problem by acting in an irresponsible way. Um, contracts also oftentimes have limitation of liability provisions. Um, these provisions will um, provide that if I, if I do something wrong, you can only sue me uh, to get back what you paid me. I hate those, by the way, because if, you know, if I uh, go to a car dealership and I ask them to change the tires and they forget to, you know, rebolt one of the tires, pay them $50 to, to rotate the tires, I'm driving down the road and the tire falls off and, you know, I'm severely injured in an accident, why should they be limited to only $50? They've caused a lot more damage. But a lot of people, a lot of companies try to limit liability. Uh, when I'm representing clients, I always say, uh -uh. Uh, if I'm representing clients against whom that's trying to be imposed, I say, no way, you know, you're responsible for your actions. Whatever happens, happens. Um, and, uh, uh, but you should limit your liability so that you're only responsible for the actual damages. There are all sorts of other courts could uh, impose punitive damages or consequential damages. There are all sorts of other damages. The answer is no, I'm, I'm responsible for the, the loss I caused you. Um, and, and you should be willing to accept that as a limitation if you're receiving that. But I really uh, don't like limitations of liability <clears throat> that say, you know, whatever you paid me is what you get back because you could be severely harmed much more than what the cost was. Um, a dispute resolution. And, you know, once again, I'm just touching on some of the broad provisions and contracts. Dispute resolution. Are you going to have to go to court? Are you going to try mediation? You're going to go to arbitration. Uh, looking at in reverse order, mediation means you sit down with an independent person and they hear your side of the case, they hear the other side of the case, and they try to negotiate a settlement. If you don't agree with the mediator, nothing's binding. You just move on to the next step. Uh, but in some way, it's an informal way uh, to resolve disputes. Well, you know, when I was involved in mediation, you know, I'd say I want hundred dollars. The other side would say, you know, you're not entitled to hundred. I only owe you twenty. The mediator would say to me, you know, you're really not owed hundred. You're you know, you, you did this, he did that, you know, you really should pay him at least 50. And then they go to the other side and say, you know, 20 is ridiculous. Uh, you know, you owe him at least 50. And somehow he tried to bring us together. Um, arbitration, once again, is an out of court procedure in which, uh, you know, there are the American Arbitration Association and other arbitration companies that are plentiful within Boston in which you'll get an independent person to sit down and basically, uh, it'll be a trial like you'd have in court, but uh, it was quicker. You know, you can get it done more quickly. Uh, you can usually get it done um, less costly. Uh, parties oftentimes split the cost of, of arbitration. And you get an independent uh, person or independent panel of three who will listen to your case and hear the other side and make a decision. And that arbitration can be binding or, you know, or it could be, you could go to court. Court, court is the most expensive and most, and the slowest of all the processes. Um, I have a score client now who's in court and, you know, to this client, the case is open and shut and it's now been going a year and it's nowhere close to open and shut in terms of getting it done. It's gonna be at least another year. You know, in, in the meantime, the client's paying legal costs, spending a lot of time on it. And uh, you know, just remember when you go to court, either someone's going to win or lose, or you're going to reach a settlement. Uh, and you know, as they say, a good settlement is one in which neither party is happy. But uh, court is going to be the longest and, and most expensive way. So 
with that, let me see if there are any questions on this. Uh, yeah, there is a question and I do encourage you to use the raise hand icon or type your question in uh, in relation to the slide. Uh, we have a question. If someone is creating a digital item for our business, what legal document should I use for freelancers from Fiverr, exam for example, so that they don't resell or reuse the design that they create for me? Okay. You should use an independent contractor agreement in which they agree not to disclose the information uh, regarding what they're doing for you, in which they agree that what they're developing for you is your property, not theirs. It's a work for hire, so to speak, that you're hiring them to do this work and you know, the property is yours and, um, and that they won't use this for any other purpose. Um, you know, I've counseled many people on doing these types of agreements while I've been at SCORE. And uh, the key thing is that you own what they develop they won't disclose it to anybody and you know you're going to pay them a price and you know put in specifics about what they're doing time frames they have to get it done by so on and so forth but um that should be in that document okay that's all we have okay um i see what time it is and people have told me i'm verbose and i i tend to believe them but um let's let's go through uh this uh hopefully relatively quickly. <clears throat> we always hear about intellectual property. Intellectual property uh, consists of trademarks. Trademarks would be a name that you use, uh, a mark that you use, like the Nike swipe, uh, or uh, you know anything else that would identify your business. Um, patents are usually uh, for Hard goods, for instance, you know, when Edison did the light bulb, he probably got a patent for that. It's a, a uh, more of a uh, mechanical uh, issue in terms of the patent. Um, it's an invention. Um, and um, then we have copyrights, which are, you know, more for written materials like, uh, you know, music that you write or books that you write or so on and so forth. Trade secrets, really, those are all trade secrets, but trade secrets also are things that are, you know, confidential to your business that may not be uh, patents, copyrights, or trademarks, just, you know, secrets in terms of, you know, how much sugar do you add to your cookies when you're making them, or how much of this ingredient to use. So trade secrets, uh, you know, aren't necessarily marks, patents, or copyrights, but they're just you know, information unique to your business that shouldn't get out into the world. Um, now, how do you protect yourself on these? Uh, trade secrets, whoever is dealing with your trade secrets, you would want to sign one of those confidentiality agreements we talked about before that said that they won't disclose those trade secrets to anybody at any time for any reason. Um, patents, copyrights, and trademarks, uh, you can protect by registering them uh, with the government. The, the United States Patent Trademark Office. Uh, you can, if you go on the site and you want to know if your name is used or your, your logo is used, you can go on and search and uh, it will come up with uh, an answer as to whether somebody else has already used it and, is, and, is, uh, and it's in use. Um, then you can file an application for a trademark. Uh, and the same with patents and copyrights. So patents and copyrights take a little bit longer. There's a separate copyright office from the patent and trademark office. Um, interested to note that if you do something in the U.S. patent office and trademark office or copyright office, that gives you national protection. You can also do a state trademark search, but that's only going to protect you registration. That's only going to protect you in Massachusetts. You know, mo most of the businesses I deal with are looking to be internet businesses or go national. So they, I, I see very few people taking state registrations uh, because it doesn't give them the protection across the country that they want. Like if, if McDonald's was just, the name was just protected in California and, uh, you know, I opened up a McDonald's with a golden arch in Massachusetts, that doesn't give them the protection that they want. They want national protection. So they go under the federal laws. 
and protection under state or federal law does not give you protection in foreign countries. But each foreign country has its own way to protect the intellectual property in those countries. And you would really have to consult with a lawyer practicing in those countries in order to gain uh, that protection. Now, there are different types of protection you can get. And, you know, for instance, you can get intent to use, which means you have not used it yet, you intend to use it. So you're forming a company and you wanna protect the name. Uh, let's think of something unique. Uh, well, let's say McDonald's at the time. And you, you, you hadn't started McDonald's yet, but you wanted to protect it. So you file an intent to use registration with the patent office, and then they would protect it for you. And you have to start actual use of it within a certain time period. Uh, if you're already in the marketplace using the name, then you can file an actual use application, which will protect the use uh, that, you're, that you're using. So there are different types of, of protection you can get. And uh, this is a highly technical area. And um, I tend to uh, bring experts in intellectual property in on this. Um, that being said, you can't protect something that's a common name. Like you can't, you couldn't protect the word, uh, what's a common word, food, you know? You, couldn't, you wouldn't get trademark protection on the word food because that's not unique. That's, that's uh, not a word that would be protectable. It has to be something unique uh, and different than, than a common usage of, of, the, of the word. Um, I'll skip on based on the time to insurance now. Uh, we can ask more questions on intellectual property. There will, will be another session on that we can deal with. Um, you know, as a business owner, you're going to want to have, at a minimum, personal injury and property damage. Somebody walks into your store uh, or your place of business and slips and falls, you want insurance to cover the costs. Uh, if somebody is driving your company van and hits somebody else, you're going to want to cover both the personal injury and the damage to the other person's car or vehicle. So at a minimum, you're going to want personal uh, injury and property damage insurance. You'll also, if you have employees, you're going to need workers' comp insurance under Massachusetts law. So that if the employee gets injured on the job, uh, he's entitled to his workers' comp insurance and, and basically does not get the right to sue you at that point. He just gets his workers' comp benefits. Uh, so those are basic policies that you really want to have. Um, other types of policies that I've listed here, and there are many others beyond what I've listed, product liability insurance. If you are selling something that you make, um, you'll wanna be protected. So let's say you uh, made a yo-yo and um, you want protection in case that yo-yo does something it shouldn't and goes into a child's eye and hurts the child's eye or um, you know, if you're selling food stuff and, and the food is tainted, uh, you'll want liability insurance to cover you for damages uh, that arise from the uh, manufacturer use of that product. Uh, that's not necessarily going to be covered by your personal injury property. You have to talk to your insurer and get specific product liability coverage. Uh, you may also want to think about business interruption insurance. So uh, let's say you lived in Sanibel Island in Florida and you had a, a grocery store and all of a sudden because of the, the hurricane and the floods, you couldn't open business. Business interruption insurance would pay you for your losses by virtue of your not being able to uh, uh, be in business over that period of time. The, and the terms differ, but that if that's a, a worry of yours, you're in a place where you're you think you, business could be your business could be interrupted by a fire too. I mean, it doesn't have to be a flood or a flood or a hurricane. Uh, you know, if there's a fire and your building burns down while you're rebuilding, uh, you know, business interruption insurance uh, could cover some of the revenue that you've lost uh, during that time period. You know, and um, you know when we talk about property damage, I, I mentioned ramming into somebody's other car, but you also want property damage for loss occasion too your goods. So if you have a uh, place of business and you have uh, uh, you know, inventory in the business and there's a fire or a flood, you'll want to have insurance to cover that. Um, most insurance will cover the business and the owners of the business. Uh, 
So, you know, people always ask me if I form an LLC, do I need my own personal coverage? And most policies, and all policies should, but most policies do say it covers the LLC and anybody that owns it. Um, some companies have key man insurance and key man insurance takes two different forms. One is if you and your partner have a business and your partner dies and you have to pay out your partner's estate uh, for the value of its ownership interest in your company, you know, to take that money out of your cash flow or to borrow it is pretty, uh, could be pretty damning for the business as a continuing business. So depending upon the amount and size of the business and the insurability of, the, of your partner, you can go out and get key man insurance so that if the partner dies, rather than coming out of pocket yourself, the insurance company pays a life insurance benefit to the, to the person, your partner, and uh, that pays out his partnership interest without the business or you personally having to uh, do anything. Obviously, you have to pay the premiums on that, but people usually get term insurance, which is uh, uh, less expensive than, uh, uh, than, um, than uh, whole life. Now, you could also get key man insurance for a key employee. You know, let's assume that I were the only person in the world that you know of that does a certain function and I became disabled. You know, perhaps you want to have key man insurance. So if that, something like that has to me, happens to me, you can get some money to cover some of the losses you incur because I'm not around to do my job while you either go out and look for someone else to do the job or while I recover. Um, you know, so key man insurance generally isn't bought by startup companies, but it is something as you grow that you may want to, uh, to think about. Uh, obviously, you know, when we talked about employee benefits, we, we talked about health insurance, disability insurance, life insurance. Uh, those are all benefits that you could consider that could fall into the insurance umbrella here. And then speaking of umbrellas, umbrella policies would be policies that go on above and beyond your basic coverage. So, for example, um, I have an automobile insurance policy that covers me up to, say, 300000 per accident. But I have an umbrella coverage that I buy that after the 300,000 is used, God forbid I need more, I have another policy that pays up to another million dollars. And I pay separate premium for that, but it's a sort of like an over and above insurance that covers you and protects you. And, and uh, oftentimes business people like to get umbrella policies in the event somehow that the business policy is insufficient and people try to come after the owner, they have the umbrella policy. Um, that was very short on intellectual property insurance, but I see it's almost an hour and a half now, and I don't want to keep you unnecessarily. Yep. We got two questions. If we could get, go ahead yeah. and grab those. Uh, one, is it true that the copyright belongs to the filer and not the original content maker if the original content maker didn't file the copyright? All right. If I understand the, the uh, question correctly, it would be if I wrote a book, but I didn't file to copyright it. And you, Teresa, filed to copyright it. Would it be your copyright, not mine? Uh, the answer is, I don't think so, but I'm going to have to do a little more research. As I said, this is not my, my area, but I don't, you know, if, if I'm working for a publishing company, the publishing company gets the copyright. Yeah, that's, that's fine. But if somebody else just takes my work and copyrights it, I'm not sure whether that uh, you know, that doesn't have a relationship with me. I'm not sure that that is going to, uh, uh, it'll lead for nice litigation for the lawyers, but let me, uh, I know I'm getting back to you on the state licenses. Let me get back to you on that too. Okay. Okay. And I do have somebody that has a question that raised hand. Um, Shamal, I'm going to go ahead and allow you to talk. You can unmute and ask your question. Hi, David. I just have a question. Do I necessarily need a lawyer to go through the trademarking process, or is there a, um, a way I could trademark without that? Okay. The trademarking process, you can do your own search online to make sure nobody's using it, and you can file your own application. You don't need a lawyer for the trademark process. Um, you know, obviously, as a lawyer, if I were in that business, I'd force you need a lawyer, but you know, I, I recommend to a lot of score clients that they can do it themselves. And we try to uh, work through the process with them so they can do it themselves without hiring a lawyer. Patents and copyrights, I would definitely get a lawyer. But uh, trademarks, 
uh, you know, if you're mar trademarking, you know, just my example, McDonald's, you can do the search yourself and you can probably file the application yourself, no problem. Thank you. Okay. Um, and then I have a comment. Uh, somebody's asking about uh, a, a, a presentation specifically on insurance and intellectual property. Um, actually, we do have um, both of those, um, and we probably will be adding those. Um, it'll be after the first year um, uh, before we we um, present those, but definitely keep an eye out on in our newsletter for when those come through. Um, you might also go to our website, and um, I know the insurance uh, recording is up there, so you can also find that um, and watch uh, the previous one on insurance that we had. Okay, uh, well, I want to thank everyone for uh, joining us today, and thanks, David, for sharing all the knowledge that you have, and um, it, and it's a lot of stuff. We know that, and if you want to meet with um, David or any of our other mentors, uh, contact us. Let us know. Um, and we can connect you to talk specifically about the issues and questions that you have that are specific to your business. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.